Good evening, and welcome to the fourth live broadcast of Crosstalks. For those of you watching for the first time, this show is a collaboration between Stockholm University and the Royal Institute of Technology, KTH. We'll get to meet some of the leading scientists in Sweden and the world and talk to them and other thought leader leaders about issues with a global impact. Speaking of the world, during our last broadcast in late May, we had viewers from 35 countries and we're hoping to break that record today. And as always, at the end of each talk, all of you watching us online have the opportunity to ask questions on the air. You do so by calling us on Skype. We're called Crosstalks TV. Crosstalks TV is also our Twitter handle, and our hashtag is, of course, Crosstalks. Now, we have lots to cover tonight, so let's jump right into our first talk. All human civilization is proof of the astonishing problem-solving skills of this species. We've faced down enormous challenges from the natural world. We've cured many diseases that were fatal in the past, and we have connected almost all human communities to each other. But sometimes solutions to problems create new problems, and that is the theme of tonight's broadcast. We will start with some practical examples. What happens when medicines developed to aid the human organism leave our bodies and enter the ecosystem around us? or when efficient agricultural production methods designed to end starvation become a threat to our survival. Joining us tonight to discuss the negative and sometimes catastrophic effects of our efforts to make life better are Joran Finveden, Professor in Environmental Strategic Analysis and Vice President for Sustainable Development at KTH Royal Institute of Technology. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Christina Rudén. Professor in Regulatory Ecotoxicology and Toxicology at Stockholm University. Welcome. Thank you. Joran Lindberg, Professor of Chemical Engineering at KTH. Welcome. And joining us from Berlin on Skype is the award-winning filmmaker Markus Imhoff. Welcome to Crosstalks. Uh. Christina, pollution, overfishing, Overfertilization are some much publicized threats to our seas, but you are working on a less well known challenge. Could you tell, tell us a little bit about what happens to medications that we take once they've passed through our bodies? Yes. Well, my expertise is in chemicals. So, so first and foremost, we, we should acknowledge that chemicals are abundant everywhere. So they are all around us right now. They are in our clothes, in the furniture, in the cameras, and so on. And our use of chemicals has increased 60-fold during the last 60 years. So 60 times more chemicals are produced today compared to the 1950s. And our regulatory systems to risk assess and risk manage these chemicals has not developed in the same pace. Uh, when we talk about pharmaceuticals, they are like a small group of chemicals and they are very speci special uh, group of chemicals. Uh, they are of course designed to be safe for humans, but they are also designed to be not degraded so easily. So that's why they survive the passage through our bodies. They also survive wastewater treatment and that way they can enter the aquatic envi environment. And these are molecules that are designed to specifically interact with biological systems, humans as well as animals. So for instance, in the last like decade or, or a bit more, we have learned that hormones from oral contraceptives, contraceptives also works perfectly well as contraceptives for fish. So two groups of hormones, the, the estrogens and the progesterones. Uh, when fish living outside and downstream wastewater treatment plants are exposed to these hormones, uh, they become feminized and infertile. And oh. just recently, we also discovered a new group of chemicals, anti-anxiety drugs, designed to affect the human central nervous system and also affect fish. So they become calm, fearless, and, and change their behavior. And this is not dangerous in itself, but it makes them more prone to be eaten by bigger fish because yeah. they are not afraid of them and they don't hide the way they used to be, yeah. used to do without this exposure. And of course, if this is in the seas, I mean, if it's in the system, if these chemicals are in the system, there's a risk that other animals will become exposed to them as well. So this might be an even, even bigger problem. Up to like yeah. approximately 200 different human pharmaceuticals has been identified in uh, surface waters around the world, actually. Mm. So, mm. so there are quite a few uh, different substances out there. 
You don't find that you specialize in environmental assessments of different systems. And so some of your case studies involve waste management. Would you say that the waste managed systems that we have today are any good? <laughs> well, they have. I think they have improved in many parts of the world, but uh, they could be further improved. I think uh, there are great uh, possibilities for increasing recycling, re increasing reuse, and also, of course, prevention of waste. Waste prevention is, is uh, we often talk about the waste hierarchy, and waste prevention is on the top of that waste hierarchy. It's uh, without any intention of, of minimizing the importance of this to the layman. Mm -hmm. uh, recycling sounds like like a very old strategy. It's mm. like we, I remember that from the 70s. Mm. <laughs> so clearly, I mean, is it still important? We thought we'd kind of solve this. How, how much more could we do? What effect would it have? Well, we could do a lot more. There are large amounts of waste um, from different sectors in society. When we're talking about waste, we often tend to focus on about our own um, consumer waste, the municipal solid waste that we're producing, but that's only around five or ten percent of the total amount of waste that we're producing in society. So there are large amounts of industrial wastes, etc., that could be reused and recycled in different ways. Are some of these much more important than others to some categories? Well, from different perspectives, I mean, some, some of the waste streams can be uh, hazardous in themselves, but others can be important because uh, there, uh, there is a lot of, of uh, energy resources uh, embedded in them. So if we can recycle them, we can save energy and other resources from avoiding that virgin production. Mm. Jöran Lindberg, you were one of the select few to get a personal meeting with President Barack Obama when he visited Stockholm two, year, two weeks ago. Can I ask what you were talking about? Uh, yeah, we were presenting some results on uh, some applications based on fuel cells, so showing different application areas. So we showed a, a car, a vehicle that's been part of a student project, which is running on hydrogen and a fuel cell, so which can take you the equivalent of 150 uh, Swedish miles, 1,500 kilometers on, on one liter of gasoline. On one liter of gasoline. Yes, yeah, so that would take you here to Gothenburg and back again, and then back again to Gothenburg on one liter of gasoline. Just to show that there are possibilities with new technology, a combination of new technology design, and actually a group of students can do this today. So, so showing that there is there are really possibilities with new technology to, to make improvements. But then we were also showing other applications using fuel cells. So one of them is was based on waste, actually. So to use... Uh, it's a project we involved with together with uh, partners in Spain where we're using leftovers from uh, olive uh, oil production and where you uh, digest those to get uh, biogas and then you can run, you can make electricity out of that and you can make a small farm uh, self-supporting when it comes to, to, to energy based on this. I think uh, you, you, you run, ran past that very sort of <laughs> br briefly. I, I did hear you say that students have developed a car that can drive 1,500 kilometers on one liter of gasoline. And you said students can do it like now, as though it, that means that it's something very trivial. But at least it sounds like something relatively easy. Why aren't we driving these cars? Of course, the, the car we showed is, is uh, I wouldn't like to drive it together with other cars. Uh, here you had a car with a weight of 45 kilos or something oh. like that, uh, and to, to smash into a, a, few, uh, a big car, mm. uh, 2,000 kilos with that. So, so, so you need to, to change more than just the cars. You need to do something about the whole transport system. Uh, but, but it shows that there are potential to give people mobility with a much lower cost for, for when it comes to energy and, 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 and the environmental burden from it. So, so that's, I think, what it's showing. I think we, so the transport system, obviously, uh, globally even, is one uh, sector where our, our urge to make things easier and better for humanity have had uh, unpredictable big consequences. Let's take this constructive, uh, hopeful message that there might be new solutions. Let's put that here. We're going to return to that in a little while. I'd like to turn uh, to Markus Imhoff. Uh, the latest of your movies is the award-winning documentary More Than Honey. In it, you take a look at the alarming decrease in the global population of bees. In many regions, 50 to 90 percent of all bees have disappeared. Markus Imhoff, why is this important? 
a third of everything what you are eating is uh, linked to the bird that eats. So the, the, the insects and the plants have a population. The plants need to make sex insects, and a third of everything you eat is like this. So between 70 and 80 percent of all the plants would just. We're having some problems with the line. Uh, uh, sorry. Yes, the sound. I'm sorry about the sound. So I, uh, do something else? Sorry, the, li uh, the line is cutting sorry. a little bit. Oh, is I, it better like this? Let's try it. Yes, let's try it. Or the mouth. Uh, shall I try it? Yes, please. So, uh, shall I, uh, did you understand the beginning that uh, this cooperation between plants and insects uh, is very essential because the plants couldn't live without insects? Let's have the numbers again. Did you say one third of everything we eat? One third of everything we eat is linked to this work of the bees. And 70% uh, of all our 80% of all the plants around us need the beet. So this so is try with that one. So this is a, a, a very big problem. I think we're going to watch the clip uh, now. Uh, here is a little selection from More Than Honey. Ein anderes Land der Welt könnte sich die Frage erlauben, die an der Universität Peking erforscht wird. Wer bestäubt besser, Mensch oder Biene? Die Antwort der Wissenschaft ist eindeutig. Nicht die Menschen. Markus Imhoff, what did we see? This would be the utopic vision uh, already existing in China when the honeybees wouldn't be here and if uh, humans would have to do the work of the honeybees. And uh, if we do, would do it, uh, an apple would cost like a Swiss watch. So only rich people would eat and the other one would starve. Why do you think it is that bees have started disappearing in massive numbers? There is not one smoking gun to, to be... One is uh, pesticides in monoculture, so the pesticides is a toxic gas for bees. And on the other hand, the monoculture uh, makes the bees starve because, the, for example, apples are two weeks in flower. And afterwards, in the monoculture of apples, there is nothing else in bloom. So the, it's a desert for the bees, and they would, uh, would die. So you have to transport them to the next uh, monoculture. This causes stress. And in, uh, in the United States, for example, they bring two-thirds of all the honeybees to the almonds in California once in, in February. And they all gather together, and uh, the diseases the bees have are spread afterwards uh, more and more. There is a very dangerous varroa mite coming from China, uh, uh, which is uh, killing the bees. It sucks the blood, and the, on the in the place where they suck, the viruses are entering in the bodies. So these are the main reasons. But it's also inbreeding, stress, and all in, all together, you can say. It's the success of uh, civilization. Thank you. What did you others think when you were watching watching this clip, this uh, dystopian vision of, of hand pollination? Does it color, correlate at all, all to, to your own uh, research areas? Well, it's an example of, uh, of deteriorating biodiversity, which of course has, like, like uh, Mr. Imhoff says, uh, many factors 
And I think he points out to, to, to several of them, the use of chemicals is one, in this case, pesticide designed to kill. They're really toxic chemicals, but also how we use the land and how we do agriculture. There are some multifactorial problems with this way that can cause these devastating effects. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's an interesting and um, very important and very sad illustration of, of how different impacts and stresses combine into giving uh, impacts on the ecosystem services. Um, I think chemical pollution, land use, um, there are a number of other threats that also interact here. Um, I mean, climate change will also have an influence on these ecosystem services, etc. I think do, here in the Nordic countries, at least, people generally assume that if something is legal, it is safe. If something is, you're already laughing, <laughs> that, it, that it's, if, if, if I can buy some, a product in the store, some kind of authority, the government, will guarantee that it will not be harmful to me. I realize, of course, that that is not the truth everywhere else, but I can also deduce from your laugh that or that, that is not the case uh, here in Northern Europe either. Who would like to start? Well, well certainly not. Um, the uh, Christina knows much more about this, but but anyway, uh, the use of chemicals is underregulated in many ways. We are uh, allowed. There is no stopping really from uh, having very hazardous chemicals in products like furniture clothing, etc. There are some areas where there are legal requirements, but other areas are, are uh, under-regulated. Yeah, for sure, that's true. And one obvious thing is that we, when we talk about chemicals, or we can also talk about other stressors, like in this case, we, we only do risk assessments one substance by sub at a time, mm -hmm. substance by substance approach. So uh, these bees are probably exposed to, first of all, a multitude of pesticides, fungicides and, and other types of, of pesticides that are mixed uh, and spread over these, these apple trees. And as we, we talked about also, other stressors that come into play and interact with each other. And, and society has no systems or processes whatsoever to really deal with these kind of multiple stressors or even combinations of chemicals. Mm. But, but isn't it also that we have the idea that uh, only the man-made chemicals are, are dangerous. If we look at tobacco, for example, it's probably the most harmful uh, substance that mankind uses, and that's made by natural, naturally by, by, by the nature. So, so uh, I, I like to object a bit about saying that it's only that chemicals are only man-made because most of the chemicals are made by nature itself, right? So, so, so I sort of. Uh, but but some of the most toxic substances we know are, of course, natural toxins, but, but that cannot be compared with sort of the spread of pesticides no, no, sure, 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 in, in saying, agriculture. I'm not saying that, the, the, that those are not harmful, but just uh, saying that all natural things are not good as well. So, so I, I, mean, I, I have to object to that. I mean, I, 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 it is a valid point. We see the point, but at the same time, just because we can fall out of trees that nature has grown, that doesn't make it okay to build atom bombs over here. No, no, no. I, I think so. So that maybe it also becomes an issue of scale, right? There are 60,000 commercially available chemicals uh, on the market. This is an approximate number. Nobody knows. It could be much more. It could be twice that. Uh, how many? How many of these would would you like to banish, Christina? How many of these would you like to take off the market if if you could? Well, the sad story is, as we said, that nobody knows. There are some estimates, like for the the new EU regulation for industrial chemicals. Uh, has identified 138 chemicals to be a substances of very high concern. We know for sure that that number is much too low. We have currently approximately two, uh, 400 chemicals identified as carcinogenic or toxic to reproduction. Uh, we have a list of 800 chemicals that are potentially affecting our hormone system. So it's not like we think that all those 60,000 or whatever are extremely toxic, but we know for certain that there is a number that, that should be or, or need to be uh, regulated. And it could be, I mean, if I should guess anywhere from a few hundred to a few thousand, that would be my guess. The terrifying thing about this is that, that bee death is one of those, one of, it's of course a symptom, but it, it is one of those things that, that has consequences of its own. I think as, as Markus Himhoff made quite clear, 
with the percentage of everything we grow being, rel being a product of the system, let's say conservatively speaking that one billion people would die quite fast if, if, if bee death accelerates uh, quite rapidly before we have any way of solving this. And, and so it's, I'm, I'm, of course I'm pulling this number out of thin air, but, but I think it's conservative. And I think what worries me is in what order we should act to save the world now with these multiple complex threats? Markus Imhoff. I guess it's the definition of happiness. If uh, the definition of happiness is uh, everybody has two cars and uh, everybody eats twice meat uh, a day, then of course we are destroying our uh, own uh, background. So. Is this happiness, uh, and uh, who who can allow to, to uh, co who can afford to live like this, and what is uh, so with the people in India? So we have to to the answer is uh, to understand humans as part of nature, and then it's a it's a, a game between all the the partners. It's like an orchestra. Maybe humans are playing the first violin, but uh, we have to carefully listen also to the cello and the trumpet. And then it's music. You're all working in different ways with uh, correcting earlier solutions to problems. How did we end up in this incredibly frustrating situation? People wanted to do the right thing 100 years ago and 10 years ago and 200 years ago as well. H how did it, is, it, is this fundamentally just an issue of sort of life cycle analysis not having been invented early enough? I, th I, think, um, I think different sciences would answer that question. Oh, how did we end up? Why did we end up this? Um, in different ways. I think uh, economists would point out the, the lack of prices for the environmental damages. Mm -hmm. When we are using um, chemicals, uh, we are not paying the price of the damages they, that they are causing. Um, so that's one reason. Um, perhaps engineers would point out the, the, the lack of technological development. Perhaps policy sciences would point out the lack of institutions and regulations. Um, so I think I think uh, different scientific disciplines would would answer that uh, in different ways. And I think also this points out um, the way we should move forward. What are the solutions? I think we need technological development. I think we need to get the prices right so that we are paying for the damages. And I think we also need to, to, to build institutions and regulations that take care of the long-term investments and the long-term decisions that we have to make. Are you others optimistic about building these institutions that can act long-term? Are you confident that, that there is any power at all that has currently that kind of a long-term view? Markus Imhoff. In my film, you see a solution which no, uh, uh, nobody has expected. The, the killer bees are the safest, the, the, the healthiest bees on Earth. They can survive and uh, they can sur live with the varroa mite. They are stronger than all the other bees. But it's a solution we wouldn't have, uh, even if it is, uh, um, the killer bees are coming out of a human laboratory. But they are now, for example, in Brazil, where they come from, the, the Brazil has become the fourth most important honey producing uh, country in the world. And uh, people are afraid of killer bees, but nature have found another solution. We wouldn't have th thought about it. So uh, nature does not need us. They, uh, nature will find a solution without us. But uh, I'm... Uh, I'm optimistic for the world, but not for humanity. For, for those of us still rooting for a solution where we're still in the picture, uh, who's, who realistically can act to build these long-term solutions? Is it, is it the, the grad students out here? Should we say to the students, you have to go out and start these companies that will do these things within, let's say, a, a, a commercial environment? Is it researchers? Can we build? Because I think, I mean, we, we, what we need, of course, is political consensus. But, but I find it difficult to see, yes. 
think we need a, 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 a young generation well trained. So I think that's why I think education is a very important part of it. And also to be trained to see this in a more holistic perspective, not to be specialized in a very a narrow field, but really see the, the, the full picture and, and, and understand that the technical solution you have to work on or the problem you have to solve must be good in many senses. It's not only a, a quick fix of something, but really fit into a bigger uh, picture. And I think we, we need, we have started to change our education in that direction, but we need to do a lot more to, to, to really show people this. But I also think there are great challenges for, or, or great possibilities for young people really to, to find a really interesting future to, to start to, to work in this field. So I, so I really encourage people to to take on that challenge. Every, but there's a bit of the future for everyone to say. Yes, basically. for sure, for sure. Yes. Because I think it takes this personal initiatives as well. It can't only be regulations or, or so on. It also takes uh, your own. Christine, at the same time, we do need to outlaw, for instance, chemical substances. Yes, I, I, I also have, of course, great hope in the next generation, but I think that this generation needs to work too. Uh, and I think we need also brave politicians that can take these difficult decisions and turn the development around to, to a more sustainable uh, course. Uh, and we, we all have a responsibility, I don't think as consumers or even as, as students, but as dem Democrats. We have uh, uh, an ob obligation to learn more. I think we have an obligation to influence societal processes and uh, in particular our politicians in a more sustainable way. So it also becomes part of being a good citizen is to, citizen is to become uh, educated about these issues? Yes, by democracy, not by as a cons consumer, that's my point. I don't mm. think that everyone should go out and stop buying this or, or stop buying that. But uh, as democratic individuals, we can affect the future of our society. Jordan Lindberg, here in Stockholm, we've set a goal to have zero carbon emissions from cars in 2030. How realistic do you think that is? That's we, a political goal. Yes, I think if we follow the trend right now, it's not realistic at all because uh, changes are going far too slow. But I think there are possibilities. Uh, Johan Fimmer then talked about, for example, waste, not as a problem, but really as a resource. Uh, for example, making fuels or making, uh, reuse them or, 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 or make good chemicals out of them. Uh, so, so there are possibilities, but we must, uh, if we follow the pace right now, we won't. I don't think we will make it because we see that if we look at, for example, uh, electrical cars, they are far too expensive today for a new normal consumer to buy them. So, so uh, the incentive is too small for, for uh, and I think that's what you're talking about, that it's not enough for an individual consumer to, to, to take the responsibility. It must be uh, easy to be mm. a good good guy. Markus Imhoff, you... Uh, You've previous, uh, you have previously made fe feature films. You chose to make this documentary about this urgent issue. Uh, why, why this? Why now? My grandfather was a beekeeper. He had a canning factory, so the bees were working for producing the fruits. Uh, and uh, my, I learned when I was a little boy that the fruits can grow only with the bees. And my daughter and my son-in-law are both bee scientists. And uh, my film is dedicated to my grandchildren because they have to live what we are giving them. So I liked very much these uh, other two answers uh, pointing the, the young generation, but also us and the politicians. Politicians, uh, it's a kind of swarm intelligent we need and uh, this maybe we can learn from the bees that they are uh, ready to think how it how something is good what they are doing for the whole hive and this uh, we should have the hive this means the whole world in the vision in our uh, personal actions and then it makes it also interesting your film, More Than Honey, has, is incredibly beautiful. I mean, it's absolutely terrifying, but it's very, very beautiful visually. And it's won many, many awards. Do you think it has, has a real impact, has had a real impact? I hope so. I, I've worked five years on the film, and now I'm traveling more than a year around the world with the film, discussing this uh, with the people. So 
uh, I think it's worth uh, doing it uh, because I wanted to tell this story and it's important that it goes on and it's, uh, it, it, it has an effect on, uh, on how things are uh, developing. From your particular area of expertise, what would be the most important change to affect as soon as possible? If you get to only pick one, you can be king of your field for one day, change a part of the world. Over here, let's start. Oh, that was a difficult one. Uh, from a Swedish per perspective, I think the transportation sector needs to be uh, developed a lot more. Today we take, just to go shopping three kilometers away, we take this 1500 kilos car, uh, and then bring back two, two bags of food. And of course, that's not sustainable the way we do it. So, so and, and we see it generally. Uh, a lot of, uh, I was last weekend now in Istanbul, and to see the traffic jam down there is uh, amazing. So, so, so we see this is a global problem, how to, how to make cities functioning without really this heavy uh, traffic. I think that's a great challenge because we see more and more people living in, in, in big cities also. So then I think this is really a big challenge. Mm -hmm. Christina? Well, there are lots of <laughs> certainly a lot of things that need to be done. What's, what's bothering me right now, just to take a detail, is how we work with the hormone disrupting chemicals. Mm -hmm. uh, during the last 10 years, it has become evident that chemicals can also interact with our ho hormone system. Uh, and at very low exposures. And this is also affecting unborn, and in particular unborn and small children up to adulthood, uh, and can lead to lifelong disease and problems. Uh, and and um, the regulatory system we have right now is not at all designed to cope with these kinds of chemicals. We don't have tests to identify them. We don't have risk assessment strategies. And they really float around and we have no control over them. So within the EU, there is now a work to develop a strategy for these this particular group of chemicals. And what we see right now is that the chemical industry is uh, rising to distort this process. And I hope really that we have learned from previous processes uh, to stop the industry from their efforts to, to weaken and delay uh, work to reduce these risks because we, we see them as really serious and costly for society and for humans. Ultimately, of course, also costly for the chemical industry because if when everybody is dead, they're also not going to make a lot of money. But this is the kind of reasoning that isn't actually in place yet. Yeah. No, they, they seem to reason very, very short term. Mm. Uh, more if, if they were to sort of join us and, and make the world a better place and, and uh, sort of have control over their chemicals, we can still use them. It's just the bad guys that we want to, uh, to get rid of, really. then. what would you change? If I could change one thing in the world, I would uh, introduce a global carbon dioxide tax that would uh, change the energy systems and the transportation systems. And it would make a change, and we probably wouldn't even uh, notice it very much. I think, for example, the, the carbon dioxide tax we pay in Sweden, it has changed the, the way we are heating houses. Um, etc the, the the energy systems very much and most people don't notice this because we still have a warm house and it's just heated in another way so um, a global carbon dioxide change would tax would make a change without us noticing it very much I, I challenge every Swede who is watching to to name the year that that was introduced in Sweden <laughs> I, I think people don't even know it was actually that that discreet mm? Marcus Imhoff, what would you change I would hope that uh, politicians and consumers help that the uh, farmers can live uh, with a, a better way of farming, that it is not a totalitarian industry, but really farming. So maybe uh, the consumers have to pay a little bit more and the uh, uh, farmers have to be uh, aware of what they are doing. And the politicians have to help them that they can live uh, like before, but producing in a better way, and we are eating uh, better food, and uh, we will be happier. So this is a, a thing that I started thinking about after seeing the documentary about the bees. Is there a real risk that that a similar multiple 
or multiply caused complex of of, uh, of stresses would develop something similar to to these B diseases in humans. And then I thought, well, have we not had increases in all kinds of diseases from allergies to cancers to obesity and uh, attention disorders that seem to be larger than, than you'd expect just from better diagnostics? Is it possible that we are causing some of these epidemics from the environment? Yes, I think we have a great concern right now over a number of these big diseases that you, you mentioned, obesity, diabetes, cancer, allergies, uh, attention deficit disorders, and fertility. We mm -hmm. see like 40% of decrease in fertility in, in certain populations of humans, for instance. And all of these other diseases are increasing in a way that we can't really explain. And the chemical exposure is probably one of these risk factors. It's very difficult to prove when we have multifactorial causes because of certainly these diseases are not caused by one cause and one effect. It's multifactorial, all of them. Uh, but there is, there is concern. And even if like chemicals would just cause a small percentage of these disease, the cost would still be huge, both in monetary terms, but also, of course, in human suffering. I think I'd like to see if there are any questions at this point from the audience. Yes, there's one right there. Go right ahead. Yeah, hello. Hello. What's your name, please? <coughs> Sorry. What is your name, please? Uh, my name is Eric uh, Leonmark. Uh, I go. Um, um, I'm studying my master's in applied mathematics. Yes. <clears throat> and so I have, well, what my uh, conclusion from, from this talk is that information and consumer habit is the, the major factor. Because uh, if you get the information out quicker to the public, the consumers, so to speak, uh, the, the consumer habit uh, would decrease of um, such that... Uh, well, with, with increased uh, public awareness of, of the environmental effects and, and all of that. But um, if that would be um, made from politicians, um, mostly, wouldn't that be a too long period? Would, I mean, would, do we need a, a drastic, uh, um, drastic action now um, with the consumer habit, mm. or um, to 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 really uh, accelerate the pace now. Thank or is you. That needed? I, I thank you, and I yes, and I, I'd like to add to this question whether whether some of this communication should be between scientists and the general public directly. Of course, we're doing that now in a, in a very popular way. Uh, but there, may, there seems to be some problems in the communications as it's being filtered by mainstream, mainstream media. What do you say? How do we, is, it, is changing the com, com, consumer habits faster the answer? I think, I think, think uh, consumer habits are important, but I think um, we cannot expect that to be the solution. I don't think there is one example of an environmental problem that has been solved by, by consumer habits. I think consumers and citizens are important in supporting politicians to, to, to act, because if consumer habits are to have an impact, Consumers must have the information available and how to get the information. Um, producers of, of, of clothes and, and furniture are probably not very happy to, to tell that in, within these products we have put these and these chemicals. So that requires regulations in order to get that information out. So in order to have effective consumer, consumer um, changes, uh, we also need active politicians and active regulation in order to support that. So that goes hand in hand, I Yet think. Yet we only have the politi politicians we elect, of course. Yes, yes. And uh, that's perhaps the most important thing we, ha we can do as consumers uh, select and, and put pressure on our po politicians. So back to citizenship again. Yeah, so, so this is actually something we, I, I talk quite often to my colleagues about, that we'd like, probably working on the wrong 
problem. We try to, to develop technology uh, that, that can make people go on the way they do without really thinking. But I think it would be much more efficient to change people's way of thinking because then we won't need... I mean, we're trying to fix our, <laughs> our, our limitations in, a, in, in, in mankind, what, what we choose and so on. So, so if people were, to, were more responsible when it come, comes to traveling or, or things like that, then that would make a big change. But mm. Christina? When, when you wake up in the morning, you take a shower, you wash your hair, you use soap, perhaps a bit of lotion, perhaps some makeup, and already by then you have been exposed to maybe several hundreds of chemicals, like four or five hundred different chemicals. As a consumer, it's absolutely not possible to, to deal with that kind of information, even if you had it. It's just too much. So I think the consumer cannot be held responsible, uh, responsible in this case. And if we're talking about other types of products, like, like furniture or clothes, there are no chemical contents declaration on these kind of consumer articles. So there's really no way to know what is better or what is worse. I, I, the word drastic action, I think, was the term was mentioned. And I think it's important to remember that in some ways there are, we need drastic changes, but in other ways, the changes may not be so drastic. Let me explain. Uh, I think the energy systems we have needs to change drastically. But that doesn't mean that the changes for us as consumers and citizens may have to be so drastic. Um, also looking at the transportation system, the transportation system must change the types of fuels we are using. But that doesn't mean that uh, the, the way we transport ourselves have to change all that drastically. We will still be able to use cars, we will still be able to, to travel, but in different ways. So in some senses, drastic actions are needed, but that doesn't have to be uh, mean such drastic changes in our uh, lifestyles. But I, I worry that there is also some, something uh, in, in our culture, and especially, of course, again, in, in the cyclical nature of our, of our news coverage and therefore our collective attention, that, that makes being anything else than short-sighted quite difficult. There was a big scare about uh, bisphenol A, is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, uh, I don't even remember, within the last year. And it was all over the media a lot uh, in, in many countries, uh, how, how uh, dangerous this substance is and, and, and how many products in our daily lives we get in contact with it then it kind of disappeared. And I think a lot of people in the, in the con media consuming audience, or, or the citizenship indeed, uh, just assume that, well, this has now been brought to the light, the people in charge will take care of it. Had, have they taken care of it? Or, or should we, every time something like this comes to the light, should we all start individually and start taking responsibility about following up what happened with bisphenol A, for instance? Christina? Well, what, what the decision makers did was to ban bisphenol A from baby's bottles. And that's a very, very good thing to do because, as I said, this is a hormone interrupting chemical. So, so reducing the exposure of the smallest children is a very important thing to do. However, it is still allowed in, into metal food cans. Uh, so whenever you open a, a metal jar with food, you are, you are still exposed. They, it's still used to line um, uh, drinking water pipes. So it can kill, still enter the, the baby's food by, by, via the water, for instance. Mm. So exposure is still abundant. We all have bisphenol A in us, and that's only one of the hormone-disrupting chemicals that we are exposed to every day. So the, the banning it from food cans would be a next good step to take to reduce exposures. Yeah. I, I think this is an example of how we somehow have to make a change concerning the paradigm of, of chemical regulation, that we are still regulating chemical by chemical in application by application. And then we get these kind of alarms and then we try to solve that, whereas there is these huge amounts, numbers of different chemical products used. So we need to somehow move from looking at chemical per chemical mm -hmm. and expand in looking at broader groups of chemicals and chemical products. And find ways of communicating this in a, in a way that it makes it possible to become engaged in the issue long term, even if you're not an expert, I think. Yeah. yeah. Can we have another question from the room? Are you also terrified by the end of the end of the world that that you don't have. It can be a small question as well. 
No, they're all brooding on their solutions. In that case, I'd like to ask you this. If, if uh, you all look at your respective fields, uh, fields of concern, what are some of the success stories uh, when it comes to dealing problems that humans have caused? Can you mention one, one that has worked? Markus Imhoff. Oh, I will. The success is that we are still alive and uh, are uh, be becoming older and older. So this is uh, based maybe also on chemicals. Uh, I guess we shouldn't uh, spoil the, the pleasure of life with all these discussions, uh, but uh, curiosity is the key of everything. And uh, curiosity gives the information and then you can participate as a consumer and as a Democrat and uh, you uh, push the politicians you want to. But I, I think the, it would be positive if we would not uh, make the definition by negative uh, thinking. What, what do you mean by that? Not make the definition by negative thinking? Don't do this, don't wash your hair because it's, uh, you could uh, be in contact with no. chemicals uh, to uh, take it the other way around. So How, the positive uh, ideas instead, yes. Mm. Very good. Do this, do this. Well, then, in that case, what are your success stories? Maybe we can find some positive constructs to follow there, Jöran. Well, I think there are several success stories. One, one example is the regulation of the uh, ozone-depleting substances that destroy the, the stratospheric ozone layer. And I think that's a uh, good example of an international agreement um, banning these uh, dangerous substances and the, the concentrations are, are going down and the ozone layer is healing. Very slow process, but it's healing. That's one example. Um, I think, again, the Swedish carbon dioxide tax can in some senses be, be seen as a success story. It has reduced the carbon dioxide emissions from those sectors where the carbon dioxide tax hits. So the problem is that there are a lot of exempts from it, so, so uh, some sectors don't pay the carbon dioxide tax. Mm -hmm. But for those sectors that it has uh, hit, the emissions has gone down. So. Christina, success stories. Yeah, several success sto stories in terms of chemicals. I mean, the, the old sins that we have from the 50s and 60s, like DDT and PCBs, we still have them, of course, because they are persistent, but, but the concentrations are, are lowering now constantly. We have some of the fluorinated compounds that were banned, and now our concentrations are going down. Some of the brom brominated flame retardants, and the same story. So we know for sure that action against these risks have an effect, a good effect. Yeah. Uh, being a bit philosophical about it, if we look at uh, uh, fertilizers, for example, 100 years ago, this was a big problem. We were using natural fertilizers for starvation around the world. Then we started to, to, to make this artificial. Now we know 100 years later that it takes a lot of energy and also a, a lot of other contaminants that, that, that comes with the fertilizer. So we start to see the, the drawback also. So, so it's hard to know. At that time, and for a long time, we thought this was really a solution to, to starvation around the world. Now, we, now, now we're not so sure anymore. We, 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 and I think many of the solutions we will come up with will, in a short or medium term, look very good. But in a long term, we might find new uh, negative effects that we really we think now we have a full knowledge about everything. But I think we will sit we see we'll sit other people here in a hundred years, hopefully, and, and 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 have the same discussion. And they will say, oh, they were so short-sighted hundred years ago when they talked about this or that, because we, 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 we underestimate or we, 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 have, we don't have the full knowledge. You're not making me a whole lot calmer there, but I, I want, I mean, because of course we've become very good at evaluating all the old, uh, old problems and, all, and all, uh, old processes and old inventions, but have the thought processes changed? Do you all, scientists, when you go to work, do you think more long term now than people did perhaps in the 50s when they started to use DDT everywhere? Is it, is it built into your work to, to think 100 years ahead now and 200 years ahead like they absolutely did not? I is think it? it is. I think it is to a larger extent is built into uh, th that you try to put your, your work in a bigger context. Christine, I would say so. Mm. Well, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure. I think, I think the development is going in that direction, but I don't think we have come very far. If we look at politics, for instance, I think it's still very short-sighted. And economics, for sure. Yeah. 
I think to some extent, yes, we have uh, we have moved uh, forward and looking at a wider scope, but still, uh, I think there is much more to do in that area. Yeah. Thank you. That is all we have time for in this first session. So what we learn is the positive uh, action is do cooperate, do regulate, do think long term. That'll help at least a little. The scientists will now move backstage to answer your questions directly online, so do keep tweeting. We'll be back on the hour with unintended consequences in the global financial system. See you then. <laughs>